we're talking about underground excavations, large earth moving projects, anything where you're going to be with any sort of significant scale inside the earth. It's rarely the case that the environment is completely dry. Usually we're going to have to deal with water. And although water is a provider of life for us, when we're talking about excavations, it's usually a pretty big hazard. So first of all, where does water come from, right? You might first think of the water cycle and very environmental things, right? You might have your precipitation, of course. Water falls to the ground, gets into the ground, and you'll remember that some of it, if it doesn't run off into a nearby stream, then it might be infiltrate, it might infiltrate into the ground, right? And that'll be a steady state process. Alternatively, in the same kind of environmental vein, you might have a stream running like this. And some of the water just, again, at a steady state, unless the stream is about to dry out, will be soaking into the ground underneath it, right? Now, these two things will explain why water is present in certain areas where you can see things at the surface, right? You can get meteorological data on annual rainfall and say, okay, this is a wet area. You can look at the topography and look at where streams, rivers, creeks, all of these things are and say, okay, there's probably some water infiltrating that goes for standing bodies of water as well. Usually more importantly, though, and, and more difficult to predict and requiring a little more geologic knowledge is going to be things that are more static, right? Things where water has collected, you know, it's been collected for who knows how long, and that's when water is trapped. That's going to be a big thing, and that could be for a number of reasons, right? It could just be in porous layers, right? Pore, oh shoot, I think... Why am I blanking on it? I think that's how you spell porous. It could just be in porous layers, right? You have maybe a very a very low permeability shale here, and then a higher permeability sandstone, and then a lower permeability shale. We'll just black those out. And maybe that sandstone has a lot of water contained within its pore space, right? That would explain why water is there, but just looking at the surface, unlike being able to see rain clouds or see running or standing water, you have no way of predicting it to be there. It just is like like a body of, you know, oil or gas that's sitting in, in some sedimentary layer like that. Alternatively, you could have structures. So structures in the same way that when we think about mining, they can help us concentrate hydrothermal fluids, which frequently deposit metals that we might be interested in extracting from the earth in that same vein a big fault like that you know if there's any water present it's going to say that's a huge path of least resistance right there i'll go up in there and then you know it finds some point where it pinches out and it reaches or you know just in terms of the pressure it reaches a a, a, a standing point and then it just stays there and it, and it gets trapped right and it only reveals itself once we've begun digging into it. So let's think about it. If you're in a big project, right, and you want to know where you're trying to develop a tunnel on some stretch of ground. This is the ground level here. We'll say there's a nice little tree, maybe a couple little trees, in fact. Oh, there's a taller tree. And you want to develop a tunnel some X feet below the surface. You want to know what the surface looks like down there. And what we usually do when we're trying to get geological stratigraphic or geotechnical information is we can drill some holes at some interval you know a drilling campaign maybe do it where you expect to to have the most interesting results the most meaningful results right so we can do these drill holes right drills and those are great for geology and geotechnical stuff right because it's if it's a diamond core drill especially then we can get all the information about the layers of rock and the structures present within them but it's really kind of difficult to get any information about water, right? Because water is not preserved in the core. Usually if you're looking at core, you'll be spraying it down with water to get a good view of it anyways. So usually what they have to do is if there's enough pressure, the driller will actually log. They'll see water escaping from the surface and they'll log that there was X amount of gallons per minute of water, right? Whatever the metric equivalent of that volumetric flow rate would be coming out of the drill hole. And then someone could look at that and estimate maybe a water pressure at some depth and thereby kind of the presence of water within the area. 
but those overall aren't too good. So we could also do, alternatively, uh, geophysical will be a little bit better, you know, gravimetric, I don't know, electrostatic, magnetic, electromagnetic, all these different geophysical methods, right, that are going to require more time and money and also more trained and specialized personnel compared to just drilling a core down into the ground. But really what we see is frequently with water, even if you thought you were the smartest guy ever who could come up with the best way of figuring out where water is underground, a lot of times they want to get projects started, right? Like if this is that big tunnel coming in, they want to start moving. They want to get feet drilled, feet cut with, let's say it's a TBM coming through here, right? And so they'll usually just play it on the safe side and, you know, they'll prepare for water. Water. They'll have this thing coming inclined at a grade so that water can naturally drain out, right? Let's say they are encountering some water here and it starts flowing into the tunnel. There's also certain types of TBMs, different machine models that are more equipped to deal with wet environments, muddy environments especially. You know, a lot of that is just going to come down to how do you deal with it in the field, right, in the moment. Seldom is it the case that you're going to be the one who's planning all this out. More likely, you're going to be dealing with the consequences of water in an underground excavation in the moment, right, as they happen. Because someone else didn't do their homework, because someone else just wanted to get wanted to get length of tunnel board, or or if it's a if it's a mine, you know, they wanted to start producing, and now you're left to deal with it, right? That's just something to think about how you're going to deal with it. We can drill as many holes and get as much geophysical data as we want in theory, but in practice, that's that's time and money, right? And sometimes the information isn't even that good. You can't explore the whole world, right? You have to be smart about it. But all of this is just kind of, honestly, it's a bit of a preamble. And I want to talk about that because that's really the more practical aspect of thinking about water in, in the field in, a, in an underground environment. But there is also the connection to rock mechanics and specifically to, we'll show it with the more Coulomb failure criteria. And how we can kind of approximate the effect of water and water pressure in a system. Because we talked last time, right? If there's a if there's a fracture, a little fracture or a joint or something in rock, and we'll represent it again with this drawing of a core here, right? It's this rock core, and you have some confining pressure that's trying to hold that thing together. All of a sudden, if you introduce water into it, right, and I'll kind of draw over it. If that fracture contains water in it with water pressure, that water is, of course, pushing out. And so it reduces the pressure that's actually being put on it. So I'll use this sigma 3 as the confining pressure again. If you want to learn the terminology, the last video I did talks a little bit, a little bit more in depth about this. And then you'll have some water pressure. And remember, this is a water pressure. Sigma is a stress, but water... You know, water can exert stress, but when we're talking about the pressure, that's a property of the water. That's a thermodynamic property that's based on, you know, really it's a measure of how much static energy is in there. You know, static pressure gives it the ability to move. If you were to tap into this little water fracture, how quickly would it come gushing out, right? How quickly could it convert that static energy into kinetic energy, right? And so we'll just call this, we'll call this a pressure. We'll call that P sub W, pressure of the water. And really, there's kind of a simple estimation that we can use for this. It's almost too simple, and in practice, you might not see this used, but it is kind of nice to think about it. That water is pushing it apart. Sigma 3 is there. We'll develop what's called the effective stress. And there's different notation that I've seen for this. Some people do that. But that prime is is used for von Mises stresses, so I don't I don't really like that. That's kind of that's kind of confusing. So I'll just call it sigma sub e, or you could write out sigma effective, right? Ooh, that looks like a row. Let's make it. That's a little bit more like an e. You know, notation not too important overall. So the effective pressure that's being applied there is going to be sigma three minus the pressure of the water. So, of course, make sure your units all line up there, whether it's PSI, KSI, or MPA, right? Just make sure it all lines up. 
And it's very simple, right? What this is telling us in basic English is water pressure reduces the strength of your rock, right? That's going to be the big takeaway here. Water pressure reduces. It's a minus term, right? Bad. That is, that is bad for us. And so not only can water get into your tunnel and flood it, right, and you have to worry about drainage and pumping, not only can it mess with the TBM if you're not using the right machine, not only is it a, is it a hazard because if you're walking in some underground tunnel and you can't see the floor, you might be tripping on broken pieces of rock or uneven ground, but it also weakens the rock and makes them more prone to failing along these slip lines. And just to illustrate this, we'll do one more little graphic here. If we're talking about, well, I think I'll, no, we'll just we'll just scroll down here a little bit and give myself enough space here. We'll say, think of this as that same Moore Coulomb shear failure criteria graph that I drew in my last video, where we have tau here and sigma here, right? And we'll start. Well, we'll we'll draw the Moore circles just for. Just for review here, remember, when you're plotting these, you would draw the Moore circles like that based on the confining stress and the stress at which the rock is expected to fail or it did fail in a laboratory test, right? And you'd have some Moore circles that are going up like this. But for simplicity, we'll erase that and just say we're drawing the points at the top of those Moore circles, right? We're drawing the maximum taus that we experienced along along that that compression so if we clean this up just a little bit here and we say let's say we have a curve that looks something something like that right draw a line through it so that's our predicted curve we're saying any stress that exceeds that level will cause the rock to fail now all of a sudden let's say that we have a point in here well, I'll draw this. Let's make it a different color. We'll make it blue. We have a point in here that represents sigma 3, right? So we have some confining pressure, or that's that's rather the sigma mean based on the confining pressure that we were that we estimated in a dry laboratory specimen. But now suppose that the water pressure in the system is you know, some amount, we subtract that water pressure, and it brings us out here, right? So that distance that we changed on the x-axis is going to be our water pressure that we subtracted from that mean stress. And all of a sudden, remember, we went from the zone below the curve is safe to the zone above the curve is failing. So the implications can be pretty serious, right? That can, Water can be the difference between whether or not you're going to have wedge failure. And this kind of thing, again, usually what we're working with is rock mass instead of rock. So this thing is not going to be what you are going to sign off on saying this excavation design is safe or not safe, right? This would just be a small component that would educate what is a much more big, a much larger and more unpredictable problem, we'll say. But that's a quick way of looking at it. Again, the big takeaway, that's just a little visual there. The big takeaway here is going to be in that equation. We'll box that off again. A very simple equation that says a very simple thing. Water pressure reduces the stress, the, uh, the strength of the rock along shear planes. Water pressure, of course, doesn't really matter that much if it's just sitting around in its own little self-contained body. Right? It's when it's in these shear planes that it's going to be a big issue because it's that shearing that it's going to help really just lubricate and allow to fail more readily. It's not going to allow it to fail more readily in compression or anything. It is a shear failure mechanism. Okay, that's going to do it for this video. Again, sorry for all the rambling on about the, the kind of real-world implications at the beginning there. This thing here is just so, it's a little bit too simple, right? And the theoretical part is really easy to understand. So I think there, there are bigger picture things that kind of 
you know, they transcend what a textbook might tell you or what the kind of obvious, you know, problem setup might be. So anyway, that'll do it for now. Hopefully you enjoyed it and we'll be back soon with some more fun, fun, fun rock mechanics.